Alexa here, and welcome back to Murder in the Mountains. Megan is our co-host this week. Hello. So this week's case takes place in Hawkins, Texas. Hawkins is a small town with a tight-knit community, the type of town where you didn't lock your front door or your car. There was no need to when you knew everybody, you know? Sunday, May 4th, 1986 was a beautiful day. 18-year-old Suzanne Harrison and 20-year-old Gina Turner, who was her best friend, decided to go to Lake Hawkins to meet up with their friend, 19-year-old Brian Boone. Did you say Tina Turner? Gina. Oh, okay. Never mind. Anyway, Suzanne had an infectious smile and was a cheerleader finishing up her senior year at Hawkins High. Gina had graduated in 1984 and was voted Miss Hawkins High. After high school, she went to Tyler Junior College with plans to become a nurse. Brian was your typical well-liked guy. He had good grades, was a gifted athlete, and he lived with his uncle on Lake Hawkins. The pair had gone to Lake Hawkins hundreds of times before. Being a small town of only a thousand people, there wasn't much to do. So Suzanne and Gina would often go to lay out and tan, listen to music, and just hang out. It was a very popular spot for the teens in the town. On this day, the plan was to just drive around the water's edge with Brian and enjoy the day. So they headed to Lake Hawkins, but unfortunately, they never made it back home. Being the good kids they were, their families began worrying when curfew came and went, so they headed out to search for the teens. In the morning, Brian's brother found his truck near Lake Hawkins, where the police had actually been called out earlier the night before. Around 7.45, a couple, Clifton and Denise Walker, were approached by who they described as a wild-haired man with tattoos on his chest, one that said, Death Before Dishonor, The Lonesome Loser. I don't. It was him. You don't think it was him, you said? No. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your opinion. Very early on. So the man stepped out of his light blue Bronco and pulled a gun on the couple. He said to give him all their money or he's taken the woman. Cliff told him, you're not taking my woman, and then opened his trunk and offered the man a beer. The suspect accepted the beer, and Cliff and Denise got in their car and drove away. But not before Denise pulled a pro move and got the man's license plate number. I'm shocked that worked. It's like he has a whole gun and he's like, just take this beer. Okay. I now know to carry beer around my car for protection. Didn't think that would work. Yeah, it has to be the most clever and easiest escape from an attempted robbery, probably in the history of ever. So Brian's truck was found half a mile from where this encounter occurred and Suzanne and Gina's purses were found inside, so that is not a good sign. Police, family, and citizens of Hawkins continued their search for the three missing teens, and police were also searching for the light blue Ford Bronco with the license plate police determined belonged to Dorothy McFadden. On the afternoon of May 5th, just a day after her disappearance, the body of Suzanne Harrison was found 32 miles away from Lake Hawkins on Barnwell Mountain. She had been badly beaten, raped, sodomized, and then strangled with her own underwear. Her body was facing downward with a clump of thorny vines in her fist, as if she was grabbing at the ground, you know, trying to get away. Upon learning about the discovery of a young woman's body, Suzanne's aunt called the police to ask if it was Suzanne. They asked her for a description of her clothing, and they asked if she would be willing to come identify the remains. She and her husband were unable to positively identify the body based on the condition she was in, but they were able to identify the watch on Suzanne's body as belonging to her. Searchers continued to look for Brian and Gina nearby where Suzanne was found, but their search came up empty. While searching for her best friends continued, Suzanne's funeral was held three days later. 
Due to the large crowds, it had to be held at the local high school instead of the church. More than 800 people gathered to pay their respects to the teenager whose life was taken far too soon. And this was like the first crime in Hawkins in a very long time. And for it to be so brutal, it just really shook the community. Yeah, it's really sad. And it was so far. 32 miles is far. That is very far. So here you have an 18-year-old girl who was brutally murdered. Imagine the heartbreak her and her family were feeling. And then you have the family and friends of Brian and Gina who are out with Suzanne that night, but their families don't have answers yet. And they're like, where could they be? So the same day that Suzanne's body was found, police pulled over the driver of the Ford Bronco and arrested him on suspicion of aggravated robbery, and his bail was set at $100,000. The man had the same tattoos on his chest that the couple said the man that tried to rob them had, and he matched the description to a T. The man was identified as 38-year-old Jerry Walter McFadden. He was a three-time convicted rapist with only a seventh-grade education. Okay, I could have been wrong. <laughs> you could have been wrong. I just, like, oh, the, it's not going to come up this early in the case. It's probably someone else, but I could be wrong. So not much is reported on about Jerry McFadden's childhood, but here is what we do know. He was born on March 21st, 1948. In parole board interviews, he expressed love for his parents, and he said he was a good kid. He was never abused or suffered any in injury that could have contributed to his criminal behavior. And like I mentioned, he dropped out of school in junior high. When he was 19, he married a girl who was only 15. Together, they had two children and ended up divorcing years later because he just couldn't stay out of trouble. In 1966, he was convicted on a burglary charge, and two years later, he was convicted on charges of destruction of property. By 1973, he was convicted on two separate rape charges. One was an attack on a 14-year-old girl, and one was on a middle school teacher. Megan is making a... Ugh face and I think she realizes she was probably wrong I thought it was gonna be just like some kind of bummy guy who got a free beer and that there was gonna be a plot twist it seems like he's just a real trash guy but is it Hawking the county in Stranger Things yes and it's Hawkins not Hawking I said what you said that's all I wanted. Strange things happen there. That's correct. So that year, McFadden was sentenced to 15 years in prison for the rapes, but he was paroled in December of 1978. So he literally only served three years in prison before being released for two rapes, one of which was on a minor. Yikes. Yeah, that's crazy. That's nothing. And she was, the minor was 14, right? Yeah. Insane. So the next year in 1979, he was convicted of aggravated sexual assault for kidnapping and raping an 18 year old girl at knife point. Wait a minute. What is going on? He got out and did it so quickly again. Correct. And obviously, he still he was out to do this. Yeah, this is not making any sense. So he was once again sentenced to 15 years in prison, but was paroled. In July of 1985, after serving less than five years of that sentence. During that time, Texas was making budget cuts by releasing more prisoners, whether they were violent or not. And because he was on his quote-unquote best behavior, he was released. Despite being a repeat offender who literally reoffends as soon as he gets out. Like you said, no lesson is being learned. That's what I was about to ask him. Like, how is he on good behavior when he repeats? I, it seems like you shouldn't be allowed parole if you get out and do the exact same thing again. Repeat offender. And like the ladies say on Morbid all the time, there are no women in there. So, of course, he can be on good behavior. He's raping and assaulting women, but he's not on good behavior because as soon as he gets out, he does it immediately. That's insane. 
What is also insane is that Shackelford County wrote to the Texas Department of Corrections. They wrote this when they found out that he could potentially be released. Okay, so this is another county in Texas writing to the Texas Department of Corrections. Okay, they said this department has had Jerry Walter McFadden in custody since 122980, and he has been in maximum security at all times. McFadden is a dangerous, aggressive type individual and is not to be trusted at any time. Security should be doubled and tripled at any time that he is not in confinement. But he was released anyway. Wow. So they obviously just don't care. And he was escalating, of course, because it ended up leading to murder. So back to the search for Brian and Gina. Searchers continued to look for the missing teens, and on May 9th, their bodies were found eight miles away from where they found Suzanne. The location was between where Suzanne was found and where Jerry McFadden was living with his mother. The bodies were found in a ditch and very decomposed because it was Texas in the summer. It was determined that Gina had been shot once and Brian had been shot multiple times. A few days later, separate funerals were held for each. My goodness, he just took out the whole group of teenagers and then took the one girl, which is terrifying because she probably, well, obviously he he killed her friends and then took her far further away. That's awful. So at this point, Jerry McFadden was already in custody for the attempted robbery of the couple at the lake. After looking into his past and knowing he was in the area around the time of the murders, he became their main person of interest. Fibers and DNA found on Suzanne's body were a match for McFadden. As a result, in May 1986, Jerry McFadden was charged with capital murder for the rape and murder of Suzanne Harrison. He was booked to the Upshur County Jail without incident. He was very cooperative, wasn't belligerent, was just on his usual jail best behavior. Do you think he took the beer as almost like this was a game for him that he knew he was going to get them anyways? Because it's kind of weird. I think that's why I didn't think it was him at first because he let them go. So it almost seems like, oh, yes. Those are completely different people. Oh, my God. There's so many people involved. So the couple at the lake had, were not the three that were murdered. So he truly let them go. He truly let them go. How does that make sense? That's so weird. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Weird. <laughs> Thank you for asking that question in case anybody else was confused. It's probably just me, but. It, it might be, but you know, you never know. Yeah. So luckily, everyone in the jail knew not to trust him or fall for his good guy routine that had clearly worked in his favor many times. Because it was such a small town, the jail only housed 18 inmates. And the inmates were held on the fifth floor of the courthouse with a nice view of the parking lot and the town square. So they could just look out their window and see what everybody was doing, you know, which is great if you're not a creep. One day, he told Correctional Officer Rosalie Williams-Turner that one of his favorite pastimes was snooping. And of course it was. She said, He told me he had been observing my daily routine, even to the point of knowing my work schedule, my vehicle, my parking lot. It was like he was targeting me. On July 9th, 1986, Jerry was getting pretty tired of playing nice, and being in jail just wasn't for him. He asked to use the phone, but he was told he had to wait. Jerry had been waiting for hours and was starting to lose his patience. As this was going on, Rosalie gets to the jail to start her shift. She said there was no one available to let him make a phone call at that point, and McFadden was very agitated. He had been waiting all day, so I called the sergeant on duty, and he came up to the jail. The sergeant walked down the hall to get McFadden for his phone call, and as they were walking back down the hall, Rosalie noticed the sergeant was walking in front of Jerry, something they had been taught never to do. Oh, just, 
I saw this coming. I was hoping it's not, I mean, obviously hoping it's not anyone, but I thought it was, I saw this Rosalie woman. Just as she was thinking how weird it was, she saw Jerry McFadden raise his arm holding a metal object and began beating the sergeant in the head with it. The man fell to the ground, bloodied and unconscious. A female guard and Rosalie both witnessed this and froze in disbelief. Jerry grabbed the cell keys off of the sergeant, dragged him into a cell, and ordered the female guard to go into the cell, which he then locked. He looked at Rosalie and said, No, Rosie, not you. You come out here with me. I need you. This is crazy. This guy's nuts. And he obviously does not have good behavior. It's so annoying. They kept giving him chance after chance. And it sucks because he was obsessed with her. So he dragged her into a storage room to look for a change of clothes, but he couldn't find anything in his size, so he headed down the hallway. He then saw the sergeant's gun in an unsecured box. Officers weren't allowed to bring guns into the building with them to ensure something like this wouldn't happen, but here we are. And I'm not blaming anybody because, you know, these people are supposed to be locked in their cells. However... This was a protocol, and it was broken, just like walking in front of them. So it's just weird that all these things that wouldn't normally happen, like, lined up perfectly for Jerry McFadden. Yeah, and I'm like, even if you're bringing in a gun and it's not protocol, why is it in an unsecure box? I'm just like, what is going on here? It's crazy. Jerry grabbed the gun and pointed it to Rosalie's side. They got into her car, basically without an issue, and took off. It didn't take long, though, before police knew of the escape, and they got a helicopter out to look for the suspect and his hostage. He ended up losing control of the vehicle and crashed into a tree. He grabbed Rosalie from the car and began dragging her through the woods. They ran for what seemed like forever until they reached an abandoned train car. They hid out there for over 24 hours when Rosalie woke up at around 10 p.m. on July 10th. She told Jerry she needed water and asked if he would find her some. For some reason, he agreed. So he hopped out of the boxcar and Rosalie tried to stand up, but her legs felt numb. As Jerry walked to find water, a dog saw him wandering around and began to attack him. Rosalie could faintly see him trying to fend the dog off with a stick, so she knew this was her chance. She began praying out loud for the ability to escape, and she felt a rush of determination, jumped out of the train, and began running. Um, I have no words, but I don't know. I'm just, I hope the dog doesn't get hurt, but if he doesn't, the dog's a hero. The dog's a hero either way, because she allowed her to get away, but I really hope the dog doesn't get hurt. As far as I can tell, neither the guard or the dog were killed. So she ran to a nearby house and began banging on their door, but there was no answer, so she turned the knob and just walked into this family's living room. There was a little boy watching TV, and he ran to his parents saying that the kidnapped lady from the news was in their house. What? What? Yeah, so just imagine this whole scene. It's like straight out of a movie. Like you're watching the story, which I'm sure is all over the news. Small town, a police officer. It's got to be crazy. And then your little son is like, oh, yeah, that woman, she's here. She's here. You're probably like, what? I was not expecting you to say that. I thought you were going to say, he was like, mom and dad, a weird lady just ran in. But small town, it probably, you're right, spread really, really quickly. But that is crazy. I was not. This The ending of this is like a movie. It's really nuts. The family came running in and they hugged Rosalie and gave her some water. They didn't have a phone, so they ran to get the police. He took her statement and began their search for McSadden. Over 1,200 law enforcement officers joined the search almost immediately, making it the largest manhunt in Texas history. This was a small town. You just said they didn't have a phone, so they ran to the police. Yeah, I mean, less than a thousand people in the town. Where did the 1,200 cops come from? Other 
Yeah, other departments, surrounding areas, and everything. Okay. Yeah, so literally more people than the town that this happened in were searching for this man. Yeah, I'm like, 1,200 cops, there's not even 1,200. Okay, that's crazy. I, it's weird he stayed in a little town doing all this. Like, unfortunately, he got away with it for far too long, but it's he never even left. Like, it's ridiculous what he got away with. Maybe it is because it was a small town. And it seemed like he just kept getting a slap on the wrist. And even in the jail, it seemed like they didn't have as strong, I guess it was protocol, but maybe they were just used to low profile criminals. So he was not from that town. He just moved there with his mom. So his crimes were in like surrounding areas. And when he was released, they begged them like, don't let him come here. We don't want him, (laughs) you know? But his mom lived nearby, and that's kind of how it happened. Okay, and if you've already said that, it is midday, and my brain is fuzzy. (laughs) But now it all makes sense. So after hours of searching, police noticed movement in a vacant house, and they drew guns and called out to the person inside to come out with his hands up. The man came out and said, here's the gun. It's me. The officer said, who? He said, McFadden. And just like that, he was back in custody. I literally hate this guy. He doesn't care about, he's so casual. He doesn't seem to really resist anything. He's just an asshole. So Jerry McFadden went to trial in 1987, where he was found guilty for the murder of Suzanne Harrison and sentenced to death. Due to lack of evidence, he was never charged with the murders of Brian and Gina, but it is, of course, believed that he was to blame for their deaths as well. Because, you know, what are the odds he killed one of them, the other two just met another murderer that same night, you know? So after his arrest, his DNA was obtained, but because it was only 1999, it wasn't entered into CODIS. But due to genetic genealogy, In 2018, police were able to identify through third cousins of Jerry's that he was also responsible for the rape and murder of 20-year-old Anna Marie Havalka in Oregon in July 24th of 1979. Anna Marie was sexually assaulted and strangled to death in her apartment. By the time Jerry McFadden had been identified as her murderer, he had been long dead. He was executed by lethal injection on October 14, 1999. He had no last words, but his last meal was a BLT with pickles and onions, french fries, and one pint of butter pecan ice cream and cokes. The murders of Gina Turner and Brian Boone are still considered unsolved legally, but I feel like it's safe to say that justice has been served for the three teenagers who were just out having a good time one summer night, literally a crime that honestly could have been prevented had he not been released from prison over and over and over again. Yeah, and I understand, like, it would be great if prison really was a rehabilitation thing, but he got out and did it again immediately. So it's just crazy how many chances he got. It's really sad that they had to die like that because the system failed exactly do you have any other thoughts or comments i they should stop making ford broncos okay so just because it's jerry mcfadden and oj simpson that's only two people and like a billion people we never we don't even know anymore it's come up too many times two times it it wasn't bright blue it was light blue light blue i'm like bro Get your light blue Bronco out of this small town. Like, you're, like, asking to be caught. And then he gets caught, and they're like, I'll stop. I don't know. I wasn't there. It just seems, I don't know. Alrighty, well, I would like to hear what you guys think. This is a very interesting case with a lot of different dynamics. I will post pictures on Instagram in our Facebook group, and you can also now listen to Murder on the Mountains on YouTube if that is something that you are 
interested in. I honestly did not know that people listen to podcasts on YouTube, but Ryan said that when he does listen to podcasts, that's what he listens to. So I thought that was interesting. So now y'all can too. So if you do subscribe, like, do the whole thing and come back next week for another episode of Murder in the Mountains. See ya. See ya.